you join me at a very, very special lake. This is the Carp Society Horseshoe Lake. It's really nice to be back, you know. It's a fairly big pond, you know. We've got 72 acres in front of us here and uh, it's packed full of absolute incredible looking carp. Now I spent many, many years over here sort of learning the craft of angling, I guess. Oh, didn't need a right run around. I am thoroughly enjoying myself. Wow, I, I honestly did not expect this one bit. Yay, we got a... Oh, well, here he is, fish number four. That did not take long at all. Right, we're on the move. Couldn't sit there any longer without seeing any fish. Well, all that effort yesterday for finding these fish is slowly paying off. Very rewarding. That's crazy, man. Put them in. That was creme de la creme. Well, this is the rewards. Quick bites. We are fishing. Welcome to the Carp Project, volume three, and you join me at a very, very special lake. This is the Carp Society Horseshoe Lake. Now, I spent many, many years over here sort of learning the craft of angling, I guess. And uh, it's really nice to be back, you know. It's a fairly big pond, you know. We've got 72 acres in front of us here, and uh, it's packed full of absolute incredible looking carp, just like they were back when I was fishing it some 18, 20 years ago. Um, I've had a good lap around the lake. It took a while once I sort of stopped in all the sort of likely looking areas, but I'm gonna sort of plot up for now in peg 37. Um, it gives me a good bit of scope of water and that's where they seem to be at the minute, this sort of off the headland, off the boat point area. So I'm gonna get back a long way down there to the van, load up, get back down here and I'll catch up with you then. Location is key on any venue, but on a big pit like Horseshoe, it's vitally important that you get yourself on the fish, even if that means a long barrel walk to the swim. So don't be put off and tempted into the first swim you come to. Simply make two barrel trips if needed. Luckily, my excitement to fish the lake where my angling journey began lightened the barrow just a little. Well, it felt like that anyway. Barring what often felt like miles to stay on the fish at Horseshoe was a big part of fishing the venue all those years ago, and I was about to discover that not too much had changed. the money spot. Well, a bit of a change of scenery. This is definitely not peg 37. So I got into the swim and I've done exactly what I'm doing now. I had a little lead around because there's a lot of weed around and I wanted to make sure there was a few sort of fishable areas. And there certainly was out there. It was, it was pretty barren, you know, it was just so much silkweed and not enough Canadian pondweed. And these fish are spending so much time in them big Canadian pondweed beds. And with the lack of it out there, I just didn't feel like there was going to be enough fish holding out there to get to warrant my time in there. So I got on my toes, I put everything back on the barrow, got it back in the van, and uh, I've done some steps today. I look at my phone a little while ago, I've done over 18,000 steps. That's the joys of big lake fishing, you know, and horseshoes no different. You've got to be looking for the fish. And um, a couple of laps later, I spoke to a few anglers, and everyone was a bit baffled of sort of where they could be. They started off in the morning, I believe, in Summer Bay, and I know a lot of anglers have gone down there. Everyone's saying, we don't know where they are. So on my way back to the van, I thought I'd have one quick lap round. I came to this corner of the lake where there's no anglers, and guess what? 
bingo. They are absolutely stacked down here. So uh, I've seen 50 shows already in 20 minutes. So I know exactly where I'm going to be fishing and that is here. As we say that, another one has just jumped next to the spot. What a buzz, you know, this is what Horseshoe gives you. It gives you that drive to keep looking, to keep looking and you get the result at the end of it. So I've had a few leads around with a real small lead, two and a half ounce lead there. And I found two absolutely perfect uh, areas. One exactly where the fish are, right next to that weed bed, which is at 15 wraps. And I did see a few fish also close in, and I managed to find a nice little silkweedy area amongst some Canadian at nine wraps. I didn't want to go casting right out in the middle and sort of <laughs> another one there, ruining my, my chance for that bank of rod. So I'm going to leave just one rod down there where the bulk of the fish are, and leave this one here to sort of hopefully nick fish as they come in and out. But yeah, I am absolutely buzzing. This is what horseshoes about, finding them, finding little spots and then getting the results. So I'm gonna get my main rods around the wrap stick, get them sorted out and get some rods out. In an ideal world, I'd be looking to get a few quick bites, which is certainly on the cards with so many fish showing. I was clearly on them, but I resisted the temptation to rush my approach, maybe make mistakes and ruin any chances. Instead, I put up my house and tied a few solid bags, which were packed full of attraction. They make the perfect presentation, not only for a quick bite, but if I was unlucky and landed on some low-lying weed or debris that I didn't fill with my marker lead, I'd still be presented. Tight and compact, the bags went out like a dream. Hitting the clip nice and accurate. Bang on the money. After settling the line, all I needed to do was catapult a few 10mm boilies over the top. Just enough food to get the fish grubbing about. Hopefully, this would hold the fish in the area for longer, allowing the bags to do their thing and me pick up a few bites. With the majority of the fish showing to my left, I felt happy to make slightly more disturbance over the right hand rod with the spawn and the traps were set. Well, it didn't take long and I'm not surprised the amount of fish down here showing. I'm sitting there in the bivvy thinking when and off, the, off she went, the left hand rod. Solid bag over them, scattering of link boilies. Oh, what a buzz. And as I'm playing this, I can still see fish showing now, so it could be a real fun night. Oh, this feels good though. Not been here for many, many years. It's nice to get a bend in a rod from a horseshoe carp. Oh, just gotta play it quite full on, because the weed right up but that's why they're here you know I knew finding them big weed beds they'd have loads of carp in them and as you can see this one's locked me up just down the margin here but just very steady pressure I'm sure she will come out just like that come on girl there's a good girl here she comes oh, just because you hook one in here it doesn't mean you're going to land them. You've got a right battle on your hands because of the weed. But I wouldn't have it any other way. And I reckon we might be netting a ball of weed here because we are, but there's a fish in it. I can see it. It's not a bad thing. She's got her head right in the weed. So let's just ease gently, gently right over to the net. And we should have our first horseshoe carp. She is ours, including Mr. Wheatman as well. There she goes. <laughs> oh, first one. Quality. It didn't take them long to get on them link boilies and the tactics work, you know, not putting too much bait out, not spawning over the top of happy fish. <sighs> right, I cannot wait to see what tonight brings. Let's have a look what we've got in the net. What we got? I reckon she looks like one of the new fish, one of the new VS fish, I reckon. More than welcome to kick things off. The old barbless hook's already come out. There she is. Pop that in there. All right, let's get the mat ready and have a closer look. Well, here we go. 
first horseshoe carp for many, many years. And it just goes to show you, if you're willing to put the graft in, you know, walk in the lake, lap in the lake constantly, find the fish, you can get real quick bites. And this one didn't take long, hour, hour and a half, 100 freebies, solid bag out there. And boom, we've got one. I don't think it's gonna be the last one either. There's plenty of fish out there. But yeah, nice to get off the mark. All that effort has paid off. Well, this is how we like to start the morning with a nice bend in the rod. Had a cup of coffee, I was sitting there thinking it didn't look amazing, but then the wind started trickling into this bay and off went that left hand rod spot where all them fish were hanging out yesterday. She's just on the surface out there, which is exactly where I want her because there's so much weed underneath her. Hopefully we'll get to see what she is. But now it's really looking good for it now. Like I said, that wind's picked up. It just feels like we could have a good morning. Same tactics as yesterday. That bag's been out there all night long. Single solid bag, over about 110 mil link. Come on, girl, keep moving. And when it was bite time, they got straight onto it. Come on, girl, all the way. Come out that weed. Keep shaking that head. Oh, thankfully that inline lead has dropped off, which has made this a lot easier than what it could have been. Come on, all the way over, sweetheart. All the way over the net. Here she comes. Come on. Last couple of foot. Bosh, here we go. That's how we start the morning, on a high. Oh, brilliant. Well, it looks like we've got a nice leathery character in there. Beautiful fish. And that is a way we've got to start the morning. Let's hope there's a few more in it. Well, here we go. Here is that perfect start to the morning. A proper old original horseshoe carp. And this one has been around for many years. Many years before I fished it, years ago. And yeah, I went into the night super confident, you know, after catching that early bite yesterday. But they stopped showing about two in the morning, and it's been very, very quiet this morning as well. Not many shows at all, to be fair, but the wind. That wind got up, and I was sitting there thinking, maybe it's time now, you know, maybe they're going to start moving around and get on the munch, and yeah, we've got one. And an absolute warrior that I'm really chuffed with. So hopefully today, we can carry on with this, keep nicking bites, I'll keep introducing the link, yeah, it should be a very, very eventful day. It was great to get off the mark on the first night and even better to see an original horseshoe carp on the bank so early on into my session. But it was now time to build on my initial success and try and string a few bites together. The PVA bag presentation and link boily approach was clearly working. So now it was important to focus in on this and simply make sure that what I did, I did well. Wrapping up the rods, casting accurately and hitting the productive clear areas tight to the weed. The best tactics are often the simplest, and all I'm doing here is taking my link boilies, coating them with a cell smart liquid to maximize the level of food source attraction. It really doesn't get any easier or any better than this, especially when you can dispatch the baits over the feeding zone with a catapult. Having carp in the zone plus bait and my solid bag presentation bang on the money can only mean one thing in most cases, action on the rods. Well, let's hope so.
Right, that was totally out of the blue. We're sitting here wondering where the next bite's going to come from and uh, that absolutely flew off. I did, oh God, I did see a few fish on the surface a little while ago, cruising down right to left. So there's definitely a few fish in the area. They're not showing what they were last night, but we're still getting bites. So it's all good. Still the left hand rod, the right hand rod hasn't done anything yet, which, you know, they're, they're swimming past that to get to the left. So maybe a little uh, a change of spots on that, but I really thought that would do the goods. But never mind, we've got one rod rocking, which is all you need. Oh, I've just got over the uh, over the weed bed with the fish. I'm sort of fishing in between two weed beds. There's a slight channel. It's fairly deep as well, sort of nine, ten foot. But getting it over this weed bed that's in front of my uh, in front of me is is tricky. But I've managed that. It doesn't feel too bad at all. This one, this one's pulling back. This one knows exactly where to go. It's uh. It's took a beeline straight down my margin and heading for this underwater tree with a load of weed around it. So, oh, no, it's just popped off of that, so that's good. Oh, Give me the right run around. There she is on top. Got a guide to the net. And number three might be in the bag. Another lovely fish. It's got a bit of weed in its head, which might help as well. Net in position. Come on, girl. Up you come. There's a good girl. Come on. Come on. Oh, no. Here she comes. Wait and all. Yay, we got her. Oh. Well, all that effort yesterday of finding these fish is slowly paying off. Very rewarding. Let's have a look at it. Right, fish number three. More than welcome, nice chunky old mirror. And um, yeah, solid bags again. That left hand rod keeps doing the bites. It's where the bulk of the fish was yesterday, so I'm not surprised. But um, now I'm quite particular how I do my solid bags and my solid bag mix. So I reckon we get this one back, get the rod wrapped up, get it back on the spot, and I'll show you exactly what I put into my bags to catch these lovely fish. Right, the good old solid bag. A tactic that I absolutely love, but more importantly than that, is the mix that goes into the bags. Now you can just use, and a lot of people do, straight pellet, that's fine. But I love to really pimp that mix up and get the most out of my bag mix as possible. Now the first thing I like to do when preparing a sort of solid bag mix is take some link activated ground bait. Now it's a brilliant ground bait, it's packed full of attraction. Now what I'll do is I'll put that into a big bucket so I've got loads of room to play with and I wanna try and get as much out of that ground bait as possible. So what I like to do is add some hemp oil. Now hemp oil is a great attractor. It's very heavy, so it'll rise to the surface, dragging loads more fish into your swim and hopefully getting a few quick bites like we had this session. Now I'll get my hemp oil, I'll put a fair bit onto that ground bait. Now that ground bait was sucking all that liquid, but it's really important you leave it some time for it to be able to do that. Okay, so I'll, once mixed up together and I've got that hemp oil thoroughly infusing all that lovely ground bait, I'll then move on to the pellets. Okay, now the pellets are the sort of the core to the mix. Now you can just use pellets in a solid bag and you'll get loads of bites. But this way of doing it, combining the ground bait, the pellets and the hemp oil, you're making the best bag mix you can possibly do. So I'm going to repeat the process. I'm going to get some pellets, put them into a large bucket. So again, I've got loads of room to circulate that hemp oil through the pellets, get them coated and then combine the two mixes. I'll combine the ground bait to the pellet. Again, make sure the ground baits and the pellet are all evenly coated in hemp oil and you'll be good to go. That mix there, it looks a lot, you know, but I'm gonna not, that's not just for one day session. I'm gonna get loads and loads of PVO bags out of that mix, and that bucket can stay in the van for when needed, two, three weeks at a time. If you look at your bucket one day and you think, the mix is a little bit dry, add some more hemp oil. Thoroughly make sure it's all coated again, pimp it up, and I guarantee you, going through that process, it will draw more carp into your swim and more fish into your net. Oh, I'm in. 
Well, that's a, a good way of showing you how attractive them solid bag mixes are by uh, getting an absolute belter. <sighs> right hand rod as well. You know, I've not had a bite on this yet, so it's, uh, this is brilliant. But again, solid bag, slightly different tactic. Last night I introduced sort of 10 or 15 spots of mixed particle boilie. Yeah, and it's just gone. Not very far out this rod, sort of eight wraps, eight, nine wraps. But they've definitely found that bag. It's been out there for several hours, but that mix would have been still pumping out loads of attractions. When they do go past, they can't resist. This one's been a lot easier than the left hand rod. There's not too much weed between me and where I hooked it, so it's been straightforward so far, which is nice. So all we need now is for it to come over the net, and that'll be fish number four. Ugh. Come on, girl. Oh, nice scaly one. Come on, sway up. I want to see you. Here she comes. And back of the net for that one. Hey, <laughs> that's the results. We've actually got two spots rocking now. Two completely different tactics, baiting up wise, but with the same result, fishing the net. It's looking good. It's looking good. Welcome back to Horseshoe, eh? Well, I was just admiring what was in the net and uh, I looked up and bosh, just behind the spot, one has just rose straight out the lake. So, yeah, man, I tell you what, you can't beat that looking and looking and looking, it all looking a bit doom and gloom, eventually finding them and getting the results. That's what Horseshoe has always been about, you know, the searching of them, finally getting on them, setting some traps and uh, yeah, enjoying it. And that's exactly what it was like then back in the day, 20 years ago, and that's exactly what it's like now. Lovely place. But here he is, fish number four. And that one come completely out of the blue, and that right hand rod hasn't done much all trip, but there you go, if they're filtering through, and you've got that solid bag, bang on the money, there's always a chance. Now one of the rules at Horseshoe is that you don't put that rod back out until the fish is safely back in the water. So uh, let's abide by that, get him back, and get two rods back out there. Right, now that that one's back into its watery home, my spare rod with my pre-tied solid bag can quickly get back on the money. Nine wraps. Lovely, feel her down, bang, beautiful. Now line lay, get that line down on the surface as quick as possible, out of the clip, but do not move that solid bag. We move that lead out of that bag, we're no longer fishing effectively try and keep as straight a line as possible as well. Don't let the wind catch it too much. And that touchdown now is going through the water lovely. Right now I've got a lovely direct line between me and that solid bag. I've not moved the lead. I've been very, very careful. And that is absolutely perfect. You know, this process here, you do not want to rush. If it takes five or 10 minutes, it takes five or 10 minutes. The most important thing is when you put it on the rest, you are fishing absolutely perfect. Right, that line lay now is absolutely as good as it's gonna get. Again, slack line to the rest, making sure we do not move that lead. So important that, done all the hard work, to mess it up now would be, uh, would be horrible. Right, bobbing on, get that in the clip. Quite a tight drag and all, and we're good. The conditions were bang on and the spots were rocking, so it didn't take long for the first rod to bust into action. This time the left-hander, fishing tight to the better Canadian pondweed, down to my left. It's barbless hooks only here at Horseshoe, and in this situation it's important to keep a good curve in the rod and a steady pressure on the fish to keep them moving. The technique went without a hitch and another strong, hard-fighting carp was soon in the back of the net. With the net collapsed and slid into the sling, another horseshoe mirror was safely on the mat, ready to display. You have to say the carp site have done a fantastic job of introducing the latest batch of scaly carp to keep the horseshoe tradition alive for many years to come. 
I was having an absolute blast catching these lovely scaly carp. down here yesterday after doing 18,000 odd steps. If you'd have told me I've had five fish by now, I would have bitten your arm off. So now I've rested the swim, hopefully we've got plenty of happy fish out there to nick a few more going into the night and maybe a few more tomorrow as well. But we're not going to find out talking about it. Let's get them bags on the dance floor, see if we can get a few more. Right, even though we're five fish in, it's important this rod goes back exactly where it needs to get. You can't get blase at this stage. Get it on the money, otherwise it's going to come back in. Let's hope it's money. A little bit of weed on the line there, get rid of that. All these little things. The big difference. Straight in line with the tree. And down. Oh my God, that was absolutely beautiful. When you get a donk of a solid bag, you know you're on the money. That was perfect. Right, line lay, get that sorted out. Hopefully that's bite number six. Right then, last rod. Line up with a tree, it's only nine wraps, so a little cast. Looks lovely. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. That'll do. Right, last but not least, and probably one of the most important bits, get this line lay as best as it can be, like I said, without moving that lead. And I know I'm fishing absolutely perfect. That couldn't have gone much better. Well, that is it, that's the last bobbin on. They went out absolutely perfect. Fingers crossed for this evening. Well, this is the rewards to prime in a spot, letting it rest and letting them get confident. Quick bites. Wow, I, I honestly did not expect this one bit. Six fish in pretty much 24 hours fishing now. Jeez, that's what it used to be like at Horseshoe. It's, um, it's changed considerably now. You still get the odd hit. But yeah, it's not what you expect one bit, but I am thoroughly enjoying myself. Just gotta steer it around these last few wee beds. I don't want it going back to that tree line again. Come on, girl. Let's grab a quick net. Nice chunky one. Come on, girl. Oh, lid's dropped off again, lovely. Last couple of foot, sweetheart. A little bit more, and nearly. <laughs> She's mine. Hey. 
that did not look, take long at all. That's crazy, man. Didn't expect that one bit. I've got the hooks in the net, so I've got to be really careful now. I might get in the waders quickly just to make sure we don't don't make any uh, any tears in its mouth. Right, when I netted that fish, I noticed that the uh, the hook was in the fish, but also the net as well. If you go to lift them out at that stage, you could easily rip the mouth, and that is when a lot of mouth damage happens. So I jumped in the waders quickly, just to make sure that wasn't going to happen. But thankfully, uh, it disgorged itself. Being barbless, they come out very, very easily. And that's very, very good when you're um, fishing these really weedy situations. So while we're in the waders, I think we'll slip this one back and send it on our way. Lovely mirror, up a double. Lovely scaly fish. See you later, babe. <sighs> Well, that was surprisingly a very, very quiet night. I've not heard anything, I've not seen anything. I had a look next door, first light. I see a couple of fish in the middle of the pond. Nothing to sort of grab me and go, we've got to move now. But I'm going to stick it out for another hour, maybe a walk round. There's possibly a move on the cards. We shall see. We're on the move. I couldn't sit there any longer without seeing any fish. A swim has become available where well, I see them fish this morning. So I'm gonna get my kit round there and hopefully get amongst a few more. Location, location, as I've said, arguably the most important part of carp fishing. And with my gear in the new swim, I just wanted to make sure I'd got things right before getting the rods out. I'd seen fish when looking up the lake, but not yet had a proper look around Summer Bay. It hadn't been doing that many fish recently, but that's not to say other anglers had potentially missed the signs. So it's important to go check myself. It's all too easy to walk past carp holding in the quiet, unfancied areas. So the steps count on the phone continued to grow as I checked all the likely areas around the bay, the weed beds, the snags and other overhanging trees, anywhere that looked like a carp could hide. All of the spots I checked around Summer Bay turned out to be devoid of carp, so I got back to my swim, full of confidence I was in the right place. So I set about putting together some fresh PVA bags, an approach that fills me with confidence. Bite-sized parcels of food attraction, great for quick bites, as well as fishing over spots of bait, and without any worries or tangles. Don't be put off by this method. It may seem fiddly at first, but with practice, you'll soon be putting bags together in seconds and casting them as straight as an arrow. Right, we're in the new swim, bag ready. I've had a bare letter around where roughly where I saw that fish this morning or a couple of fish this morning. 
It's nice and clear at 21 wraps. So instead of putting loads of bait out, I'm gonna try and nick a bite with our bag that's packed full of loads of attraction. So let's try and get this on the money. Get a bite. Oh mate, that was creme de la creme. We are fishing. Right, you join me here at the very historical Horseshoe Lake, and uh, I've got a lot of history to here as well, you know. It's something where, somewhere where I pretty much grew up as a teenager from sort of 16, 17, 18. I spent a lot of time on these banks. I've walked it many, many times, and I've got so many great memories. And coming back has brought back a lot of them memories as well, and uh, the lake hasn't changed much at all. It is still absolutely gorgeous. The fish as well. You know, the, the fish stock has changed over the years. You know, there were real heavily scaled old leanies back then, and there's still quite a few in it. Um, but the VS fish now are pushing through loads over 30 pound, and then I'm sure there'll be a 40 pounder back in here as well soon. But back then there was a fish called the patch, and the patch was, was a daddy-o, you know. It didn't come out a lot either. Real long fish, real heavily plated with a big sort of bare patch in the middle of it. And uh, I, never, I never, never did actually catch it. I did photograph it once at 41 pounds. And um, yeah, that, that fish was the drive for everyone. You know, there was a lot, there was loads of awesome 30s, but patch was like seven or eight pound bigger than anything in the lake. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't, never caught it, but it still lives fondly in my memories. But now, like I said, I spent a lot of time over here. I think my longest ever trip was, uh, was six weeks. And you're probably thinking like, how the hell did you get to do six weeks on the lake? Well, I didn't do very well at school, you know. Um, I ended up getting expelled very, very close to um, the school holidays in my last year. And uh, so, yeah, I got expelled. No, no particular reason, it was just, I was just a naughty boy at school. And um, my dad was like, what's the plan now? Like, you've messed up, like, what's your plan? You're gonna sit at home for the next six to eight weeks and do nothing? Or I was like, well, no, nah, like, I'll go horseshoe. He's like, how's that going to work then? I said, well, you know, drop me off and come down every now and then and resupply me. And that's pretty much what happened, you know. I was, um, I was pretty much based at Horseshoe for my longest session was six weeks. And uh, my dad would supply me with a sack of pellet, uh, a sack of party blend, which I'd prepare on the banks. Give me a few quid in my wallet to, uh, to feed me and stuff, which, uh, to be honest, it didn't really go to feeding me. It, it went to uh, catching the fish, you know. I'd, uh, I'd probably spend more money on, on restocking my leads and spoms and things like that rather than looking after myself because the first year, I was so out of my depth here. You know, I've gone from quite small lakes where I'm only fishing at the time, sort of 20 or 30 yards out, a rod there, and another rod 30 yards down the bank, and horseshoe fishing was completely different. You know, and I, I learned that very quickly. You walk into the, the swims of the anglers that knew what they're doing and catching regularly, and they'd have three rods, like bowstring lines, boom, 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 all down, all down perfectly parallel, and you see them spotting over the top, and just, just terminators, you know, catching loads of carp. And when I arrived, it was, I was like, this isn't normal, you know, I'm used to just mark a floats and feel my lead down, and, but I quickly learned that that was the way and I had to learn quick. And to be fair, it took a long time. And I remember the first year, I struggled. Absolutely beat myself up, you know. I knew what I wanted to do, because I didn't know how to do it. It was just, there was crack offs and very frustrating, sitting there in the middle of the night, you know, and you can hear other people's alarms going off and you've got fish in your swim going mad. And I'm not fishing for him. I'm fishing in the weed, and my bait's everywhere. But quickly learned to sort of, interact with the other anglers that were doing really well. I was probably a borderline punisher at the time, you know, I was in people's swims, like, trying to absorb what, what they're doing, you know, like, how comes he's, how's he getting his lines that tight? And just asking questions like, and um, I made a lot of friends and sort of people took me under their wing a little bit and they showed me the ropes and, you know, and, and I progressed, progressed and progressed and uh, yeah, finally, finally started getting amongst them, mainly in Summer Bay. Um, I sort of took myself away from Winter Bay because in there it was all 80 to 100 yards where Summer Bay I could go back to my sort of comfort zone a little bit and, and fish little bags in the weed and um, just getting, get, getting used to sort of playing fish in the weed and um, getting into spawning because it's nothing like I've done before. 
And uh, yeah, and like through, through, that, through that second year, so the first year was almost like a write off, you know, I didn't catch hardly anything. But the second year, coming out of winter, coming back down here in the spring, I was, I had it in my mind, I, I, there was a game plan, and uh, I then started getting amongst the hits of fish. And um, that took a long, long time. You know, I was at the beginning nicking ones and twos here. But before I knew it, I was understand, understanding the lake. You know, I sort of knew where they were going to be at certain times. I was getting ahead of the fish, which was a massive plus. And uh, I was fishing correctly, more importantly. But the most important thing of all that I learned at Horseshoe that stayed with me today is location. You know, if you're not on them, you just, you're camping, you know? And it's something that stayed with me and I'm, I'm glad that Horseshoe taught me that. Because whenever I rock up at a lake now, I'm walking, I'm looking and I'm not settled until I know that I am as in the best position I can be to catch a few fish. And if that means wasting a night sometimes to get where I need to be, then so be it. I've, I've done many a camp night to get to somewhere where I need to be. And um, yeah, Horseshoe teaches you that. But yeah, it took me a long, long time before I even caught my first 30 out of Horseshoe as well, you know? And I, and I remember it like it was yesterday, you know? It was, uh, I, was in, I was in the big double in Winter Bay. There weren't that many fish around. And I, I believe I was actually in there because I could, couldn't get in Summer Bay. And my mates had come down for a social as well. They actually won a competition um, for a, a guest type ticket or a day ticket on, on Horseshoe. And uh, my mate Carl and myself were doubled up in the big double. And I put him on the left hand side, which was, you know, that's, that was the area straight towards big, straight towards uh, disabled at about 26, 27 wraps. But back then, actually, we never used to wrap our rods out. You know, they weren't even invented sort of 18, 20 years ago. We'd put a peg in the ground, um, sort of next to your swim, and you'd walk your rod all the way down the Whitney Bank or wherever you was until you hit the clip. Um, put another peg in where that was. And each time you caught a quarter fish or wanted to recast, you know, your lead was by the first peg and you'd run down the Whitney Bank, reel against the other peg, in the clip. Hard work, you know, if you're catching 10 fish a night sometimes, you know, you'd be doing like 100 yards, 500 yards of a night time. And uh, but yeah, you just, that was the horseshoe way and it was until the rap sticks came out. But, but yeah, that first 30 come around, I put Cole in the left, said to him, right, there's, there's, there's the peg, mate. Put your lead there, walk down to there, and uh, bang in line with the sable, we'll get your rods out. He done that and uh, went to cast out, nowhere near it. And uh, several casts later, still, he was lower near. He's like, look, mate, I can't get that far out. He'd never done that style of fishing either, you know, but I'd been a sort of year and six months into it by now. And I said, well, no worries, mate. There's a spot closer in on the right. You go on that and I'll go on the left. And um, so that's what we done. We sort of swapped rods around and uh, I got my rods out there that night. Middle of the night off, she's gone. I wasn't expecting too much because there wasn't a lot in winter bay at the time. Off she went and uh, yeah, first 30, man. 30, I think it's 35, 12. Awesome, awesome linear. And that's one of the biggest carp I ever caught at the time. After catching that first 30, uh, the ball started rolling, you know. I really started getting amongst some of the um, the old horseshoe gems, you know, amazing looking fully scaled, just the best lineage you've ever set your eyes on. They really don't make them like the old horseshoe leanies, but yeah, I guess you know, horseshoe, I sort of turned a corner in my angling. You know, I, I came with what I thought was an understanding of carp angling, and it wasn't, and left with a very good understanding of sort of fish location, where I need to be, the, the rigs I need to use, and just the whole, range of angling skills that I never had. So yeah, I, I hold it very dearly in my heart and uh, it's been very, very nice and enjoyable to come back and film this episode of uh, Carp Project. Well, I've given it a few hours in there. I've not seen a lot, but the beauty of Boat Point, you get a good vantage point for the Winter Bay. And I've seen a lot of fish down the bottom of it. So there's only one thing to do, load the barrel up, get down there. Final night, the 
final spin of the dice, as they say. But yeah, I was sitting on boat point. It wasn't looking great, so I was having a look around the lake and uh, yeah, I see quite a few fish down in Winter Bay. To my surprise, I thought they'd be in the shallows, but that's fish, they go where they want to go. So I got round here into a swim called the White Post. Plenty of fish out there. And uh, you know, a little bear led around, a dozen casts or so, and located a lovely little gravelly area just before a big old weed bed. Now hopefully, they'll stick to that weed bed like glue during the day. And in the night and the morning, when they want to get their munch on, they're going to drop down onto my lovely little gravelly area where my solid bags will be. And the old bobbins will be dancing. That is perfect. See so yeah, my mix? Um, I've got a, a wet mix and a dry mix. My dry mix is just pellets, basically. And my wet mix is boilies, hemp and maize. Now, how I like to prepare my mix is first of all, I get some 10 mil link or 10 mil cell, whatever you want to use. Add a good coating of smart liquid to it. Leave that to a side for a little while. Let, that, let the boilies soak in a bit of that smart liquid. And to that, I add some hemp and maize. Now, hopefully that's going to keep the fish grubbing around all them little hemp particles for a long old time. Now in my dry mix, eee. get hard that one, lovely. To my dry mix, I've got some spotting PVA pellet, which is a several different size pellets, ranging from sort of 0.5 mil up to about four mil. Loads of different breakdown times. And to that, I've added some cell response pellets. Again, slightly larger pellets. They're gonna break down that little bit longer. I keep my two mixes separate. I don't want the pellets breaking down in my wet mix. I want them breaking down on the lake bed, or in the gravel in this case, and letting their, all their attraction off in the swim rather in the bucket. So yeah, that's the mixes. I'm gonna give them, I don't know, 10, 15 large bombs, plenty of bait out there. So once they come on you in here, there ain't just three or four, you know? That is mint. Beautiful. And then once these are out there, three solid bags, bang on the money. Yeah, we'll see what tonight brings. I'm confident. Well, the morning bite time, I believe, has passed. That sun has burnt off the mist and um, it's not looking great. But while it's not, it's not all doom and gloom, I thought I'd run you through my solid bag setup. So it's all pretty, pretty simple stuff and that is the joys of solid bag. There's not too much going on. Inline lead, which I'm fishing drop off, you know, there's a lot of weed out there and I don't want to lose my prize once I've hooked it. So once that fish picks up that hook, that lead will drop off. The fish will rise to the surface a lot quicker and it'd be in the back of my net every time. Um, so yeah, three ounce inline drop off, and to that I've got about three and a half, four inches of 18 pound Supernatural. And on the end there, I've got a crank. Now when I'm fishing a barbless hook, like we hit, have to here at Horseshoe, I much prefer a nice big point hook. Now I've hooked six fish this session, and I've been lucky enough to land six fish, and that is, I believe, down to the hook and that big point. Now, as you can see, I've got my my hook, my, my hair, sorry, coming off quite, quite into the bend. Now again, that's aiding in the hooking of the fish as well. This is quite aggressive when it goes into the fish's mouth and it turns very quickly catching hold. Now, I'm always playing with my sort of hook bait presentation and of late, this has done me a lot of quick bites. And when you get quick bites, you've got to think to yourself, you know, you're onto a winner there. So yeah, that's my preferred sort of hooking arrangement and hook bait as well. When I've got my 
my hook link coming off quite late into the hook right on the bend, I much prefer a bottom right bait rather than a pop-up or a wafter. I want to make this point in the hook as heavy as possible and that hook bait is aiding in that. So yeah, little whittle down, essential cell dumbbell there. I use link ones and cell ones also. But it's very simple, very basic, but trust me, it's very, very effective. Right, to create the solid bag, there's a bit of a process to it. First off, I get a small solid bag and I'll fill it sort of third filled with that lovely mix to about there, okay? Then I'll get my three ounce lead and I'll go lead first, really important. And I want my lead on one side of the bag, as tight as I can, I want that lead against the bag like that. I'll grab some more mix and come to about three quarters filled. Now you see my hook link there, it's hanging out the bag, that's perfect. I'll then pick up the bag in this position here, get my hook bait then, and on the opposite side to where the lead is, I'll pop the hook bait in, so I don't get any tangles, nothing like that. I'll manipulate the hook bait exactly where I want him, so the hook follows, and now I'm fishing. Lovely, make sure the hook link's beautiful, top it up. And all I can see now is pellet on the top and no hook link. My hook bait is there, my lead is there, then I'll go and tie the bag off. I'm tapping, I'm tapping, I'm trying to compress as much pellet into each other as possible to get that bag as solid as possible. You know, it's called a solid bag for a reason. If you want to try and make it as tight, so it casts better, go for the water quicker, quicker and just be all round more aerodynamic as well. Just getting all them pellets in the nooks and crannies. That's beautiful. And I get a bit of PVA tape and uh, leave about two or three inches up one side and wrap around going down each time. So I'm going underneath my last wrap. Go about five or six times. Burn it off. And then tie the bag off. Two overhand knots. You can all do this sort of no-handed now. Now the bag's tied off. I want to make it as aerodynamic as possible. So at the minute that's not going to fly through the air very well. So I'm going to get the edges, I'm going to tuck them in, and a little bit of licking sticking. So a little bit of saliva, let the bag get tacky, and I'm going to pull it quite a lot. Look how much stretch I'm getting there. Right over back on itself, and that will stick. I'll then repeat the process on the other one. Again, tuck it in. Nice little round ball. Think like a golf ball. A bit more saliva. And again, you watch how much I pull this, look, all the way over, back over the last fold. And then it's about just manipulating the bag into what shape you want it to be in. That's stuck now, that's lovely. Cut off all the excess, the excess PVA tape first, leave it two or three mil, and then the excess bag as well, we'll get rid of. Now that is looking all lovely. And there's two reasons why I like to have my lead one side and hook bait the other. The most important one is when I cast this out now, that lead, gravity has to kick in, no choice. And it will always land lead first and your hook bait is then presented on the top of the bag and fishing effectively. Secondly, my hook bait is always the first thing they're gonna see when they come onto the bag, you know? That lead's first, the hook bait will be on top of the bag mix once it's all melted, fishing super, super effective. And hopefully, that's gonna make me one last bite. Well, last night as drew a blank, you know, I was really confident going into last night as well, but uh, this morning it looked good and all, you know, the mist rolling off the lake, but the sun come up, it burnt that off and it pretty much burnt our chances off as well. So, you know, that's fishing, you don't always get it right. We had a good start to the session, so I can't complain. You know, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed myself at Horseshoe again. It's been great to come back, great to see how it's sort of grown on in the last few years, and I'll definitely be back for some more.